What's your story? I need a pre-qualification letter. Okay. For a business loan. Okay. I have a dream that I want to open a piano bar. Mr. Fagan, I'm gonna level with you. Save some more money. How much money? If this is how much you have now, you would need like this much in every direction, cubically, that much more. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Monty Fagan, and I will be the new piano player here at the hotel. Just because you're playing here tonight doesn't mean the job is yours. I'm Olivia. What? Will you play Meet Me Tonight in Dreamland? I will definitely play that for you, yeah. This is bad. Relax. Where is your confidence? I don't know. Hello, this is your mother. Monty, are you okay? Just call me, will you? It's a blank canvas. You can yeah. do whatever you want here. Is there any wiggle room in that price? No. Well, there shouldn't be because it's a steal. I missed you. <laughs> you can't miss me, baby. What is that? I wanted to help. It's just a start. I just, I want to be with you. It's funny we talked about this. This is my piano teacher. Monty, this is my husband, Alan. Hi there. Nice to meet you, Monty. It's so nice to meet you. Sometimes you just have to take a step back and really contemplate what it is that you're doing. It's all about choices, dude. What notes you play, how you play it, when you play it. 12 notes in an octave. Well, everybody has a dream, right? You could join me. Robert, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, so let's start with why you wanted to make a movie. You, you're in a fairly successful band. Is, are movies in your blood in your, in your family at this point? Like it's almost been... You want to check it? <laughs> just if I take open it blood. up, do Take we... it. Um... Cinema what if flow? movies just came out of yeah. the bloodstream? Um, how you guys doing, by the way? Thanks for being here. So we're live. Yeah, we're live. So everyone, we're live right now. So everyone be cool. Um, so um, I grew up, my mom's an actress. And uh, she's Great a actress. dramatic, thank you very much. She's really a dramatic person. Like she'll slip into character without even telling you. And then she'll be like, I was just doing a, that was a character. So it's kind of funny when you have a mom who's always slipping into character. But, um, but my, my dad was a film producer as well. So I grew up, uh, you know, we had movie, uh, like movie posters in our house and promo materials kind of around. So it was cool kind of being around that as a kid and going to movie sets and helping out on set as a PA for the summer. And um, so movies are a big part of my life and also music because uh, my grandfather was a conductor, a composer, and uh, movies and music are really tied together, I think. Very well-renowned com composer, too, like a well-regarded composer, yeah. yeah. Armand Coppola. Yeah. Um, and they're all from the East Coast. They're all from Long Island and Brooklyn and stuff like that. So East Coast roots here, but West Coast upbringing. Mm -hmm. But uh, so anyway, so music and film is, has always been a part of my life. And so, yeah, I, I've just, I've been so close to it my whole life that um, I've, I've had an interest in it, and as a kid, I used to make movies with my friends. I went to film school and learned how to shoot on Super 8 camera and how to edit. And so anyway, so music and film, it's storytelling. It's all connected. And when did you decide that you were ready to sort of take on making a feature film? Um, I just always wanted to do it, and I wanted to be a director growing up. And I think part of the fun of it for me is trying to figure out how to get stuff done. Because, uh, you know, we're faced with, you know, there's obstacles as you try to pursue things. And the question is, how do you figure out, how do you work around those obstacles? And I think, you know, even people who are well-established filmmakers or musicians have to overcome certain things as well as they put out new music or make a new film. I think even filmmakers who are making $200 million movies have to go... Uh, absolutely. Every day have to think about, oh, how am I going to get around this? Totally. You know? yeah. And that's, to me, that's the fun of it is problem solving. Um, I think it's fun when you're faced with a new obstacle because it's it's a challenge to it's creative to figure out how you work around it, and you know if if an actor drops off a, a movie, we had a, an actress who couldn't do our movie at the last like two weeks before shooting, and it's scary because you have to sort of reimagine this cast, and but to me it was like it's all it's all going to be okay. Everything happens for a reason, 
and I think we'll figure out a way around this. And it ended up being a really exciting um, change to the, to the movie. It's also one of those things when you're movie making in terms of problem solving where even if you have everything you want on the day, when you set up your shot and your actor gets in the frame, something's going to be a little bit different than how you imagined it. And you have to sort of then problem solve in terms of making it the best thing that it could possibly be right. for the way that it's already adapted itself. You know, the actor is right. going to do the performance a little bit differently than you imagined, or the frame is going to be just a little bit different because, you know, the location isn't exactly what you had initially thought of. So you have to say, well, how can I put all these things together now to make it even better than what I imagined? Yeah, I, absolutely. I think that there was, a, I've talked to this music producer who, um, did a lot of really cool records in the 80s, and he said that sometimes he would make, there would be a lot of mistakes made while they were recording, and I, I totally connected with that because when you use a lot of software today, you can kind of accidentally move something over here that was meant to go there. You stumble into things, and it's those mistakes that I think are really exciting because I think it shows you a new perspective of something you might have thought you had control or a grasp over, but can be unexpected and can inspire a new idea. Did you have moments like that on the set of uh, Dreamland? Yeah, I mean, there were days where we lost, we, did, we shot the movie in 18 days, and I, I, a lot of people, I mean, I didn't know what that meant. Like, I say it, I say it at like screenings, like we shot, at, at Q and A's, people are like, how long did it take to shoot this movie? And when I say 18 days, everyone's like, oh, there's always like a gasp in the audience. And I never... No one in your family told you that that was going to be difficult? I didn't know until... No, I had no <laughs> idea. And I, I... Because it's just, it doesn't... To me, it's just like, it, whatever it takes to do it. If, if 18 days is all we have, we're just going to have to shoot it in 18 days, right? And if we didn't get what we needed, we're going to have to figure out a way to go back and get something else. We're going to figure out a way to t retell that part of the story. So that's, again, that's going back to these obstacles that are unexpected that might lead you in a new direction. And that did happen. We, for example, there was a scene, and you guys haven't seen this movie. It comes out on Friday, everybody. This Friday, 11-11. That, that was good. Is that okay? Yeah, that was great. Um, <laughs> that's what you're here for. <laughs> thanks. But there's a, there's a moment where one of the characters has this sort of affair, and um, we lost... Uh, time to, sh to cover the scene from different perspectives. So sometimes you'll notice in a movie that we're going to start with a certain establishing shot and then we're going to get coverage where there's a close-up where he grabs the coffee and you see his hand grab the coffee and you see her smile. So you, you can shoot a scene with different sort of, you can get different coverage to tell that story of that scene. And there were days where we lost the ability to cover a scene and get more out of it, and we let it play out in a wide shot. And luckily, the actors uh, moved in a certain way, or there was a certain tempo established in the scene that kept our interest as a viewer, and we didn't have to cut around it. So we let things play out in a wide, unexpectedly, not as planned, and it kind of worked better for the movie in that way. And did you sort of end up after, at what point in the shoot did that happen, and then that, did that start informing the way that you shot some of your other scenes following that? Well, something, I, this was my first feature film, and um, something that I quickly learned was that we had to move much faster than I thought we were going to have to move. So I ended up getting a lot of takes in a wide shot, and everyone was like, we should really like go in now. <laughs> And I kept wanting more out of the actors in that wide shot. And um, anyway, so there was, there was stuff that I learned maybe like five days in that we had to like move much faster than I thought. But again, it goes back to that idea of actually the wide worked best for that scene. And stripping it all back, it's like a, it's like a great play. It's like the way you stage a live show. Um, the way people move within a space can tell its own story. And I think we... We stumbled into that, and, and I think that was a good problem that we had. Now, let's talk about where the movie comes from, just the story itself. It's a story of a musician, you're a musician, but this is a sort of uh, lounge room piano guy who's sort of looking to start his own piano bar, but it's scored by a, a different type of music. Talk yeah. about where that story came from and where the music came from in relationship to that. So um, my background is in music um, as a profession, for 17 years, I have a band called Rooney. Thanks. 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 That's good. Did someone tell you to do that? That's no, good. Um, Put a new album out. 
I have a new album called Washed Away. It's on Spotify and iTunes. You can add it to your playlist. Um, so I'm used to making albums, and uh, I tell so I tell a story through music, and I love music in film. And the fun of making this movie, Dreamland, was thinking before we shot what this type of music was going to be in this film. But there was also another hurdle, which is if you have an actor on screen playing piano, I have to convince you, the audience, that he's actually that guy playing that song. And that's not really, when you're playing classical music or jazz music, it's not that simple to sell this idea that that guy's actually playing, right? Because that's a really, it's, it's pretty amazing to watch a great piano player. That's a skill that takes time to, to get that skill. So if I want you to believe that's him, it's, I have to, we have to create that feeling that he's really doing this. So you have on-camera piano music that's being heard on screen while he's playing it. And then you have this music taking place around the characters, which is the score that we're writing to tell, to fill in that other part of his story. So there's a duality in this, in this score between on-camera music that relates to his character on screen within that reality and then this other reality of what his dreams and hopes and his struggle as a character, we're telling another side of the story using synthesizers, which is a different landscape of music from what we're seeing on screen. So it's fun to craft that kind of story. And it's, it's, you're juggling this, these two different styles of music. And I personally, I make, you know, Rooney's a sort of rock and roll band, right? But that doesn't mean the only music I like is that. I, I, I like my music listening is all over the place. And um, sorry. What's playing on your Spotify right now? Or what like was a lot of ELO? Thing? I'm like a big ELO fan. Big ELO fan right That's now. That's like all. I mean, I listen to ELO a lot. Genesis. I like prog rock. Um, prog I like, rock. Something about prog, prog rock. rock I learned recently yeah. doesn't translate well to other countries. Oh really? <laughs> many other countries. I mean, except maybe with the exception of, of the UK, but many like Italy and yeah. a number of other countries have these massive prog rock sort of genres with yeah. like a lot of bands. Like prog rock was huge in these countries. Right. It's not that good. <laughs> really? <laughs> There's yeah. I mean, I think that I'm just open to all types of music because you learn something new from everything. And um, so I, I was excited to have a piano player character playing this really exciting music on screen and then to incorporate a lot of the sort of 80s synthesizer stuff that I grew up listening to um, and seeing in movies when I was growing up. And I had older, older brothers that shared a lot of movies with me. So I was exposed to a lot of movies that maybe my like, generation hadn't seen. But we talked about Risky Business before. And I love that score, the Tangerine Dream score. Um, and a lot of today's pop music is actually pretty 80s influenced. There's a lot of synth and a lot of program drums and stuff like that. But anyway, so it's fun to figure out how these two styles of music live within one world and how they both tell a story together, how they, pl how they work together. And that was a balancing act in, the, in cutting this film, was uh, how do we tell a story musically? And I think what's great is a lot of people who've seen the movie have responded really positively. They feel the music draws them in in a whole other way, so. Where did, the, where did the story, or at least this character come from? I mean, this character who has, who's having a kind of crisis of confidence and a, a hard time sort of coming to terms with his, his, his possibilities and taking charge of them and has this affair with, a, with a, a beautiful older woman. Where did this story come from? And he's also kind of a quirky, yeah. odd guy. Yeah. Um, well, I grew up, I grew up in LA and, um, I wanted to tell a story in Los Angeles and I thought it'd be cool to use locations that we might have access to because when you're making an indie feature film and when you're doing it on a low budget, you have to figure out how to tell your story within your budget. And, um, so that's the problem solving thing that I talked about earlier that I really like. And we, we crafted the story. Uh, to sort of represent, you know, places in LA that we were inspired by, locations, because locations can inspire a story, just w with a great location. But um, especially with the title like Dreamland, you kind of want to have yeah. locations that are at least somewhat seem somewhat influenced by the title, or vice versa. Right. Totally. Um, I just, I mean, I really like the idea of following this this young guy's journey, and what sort of his expired relationship was like with his high school sweetheart. Um, they live with her mother, who's like a to she's like so divisive, and the mom and her, and the and his girlfriend Liz are so 
like they have their own clique and he's sort of an outsider in their relationship. He's an outsider in his own home, really. And they're also like pretty physically detached. Like they haven't been together in a long time and it's led to a lot of frustration and a lot of, it makes him more vulnerable to an Olivia type of woman, a predatorial married woman who kind of works, his, works her way into his life because he's needing something at that time. Uh, but, you know, I, I love the idea of him, be, it, the idea of things are temporary. Because I think when, thing, when there's uncertainty in your life, I think it's harder than having a yes or no answer. When you're in that middle phase, and we're going through right now, I mean, tomorrow's a really big day, right? We're going to, like, vote. Possibly the biggest day. But we've been living in uncertainty for a long time, and it's really scary to have uncertainty. And I think for this character, Monty, in this movie, he's living a life of uncertainty. And no one really takes him seriously because he's been chasing this dream and chasing that dream. And at that time is when he meets this woman and they have this wild kind of short-lived love affair. But it's able to refocus him and get him on a new path. Maybe it's not what he dreamed of, but it's something new. How long did it take uh, to write? And what's it like? I'm sure your family's incredibly supportive, but what is it like showing them a script that you're working on, considering that, you know, your brother was in Rushmore, he works with Wes Anderson, All he's written with Wes Anderson, your mother was in The Godfather and has worked with David O. Russell. I mean, some of the greatest scripts ever written have passed through the hands of members of your family. I would imagine that you want them to sort of give you notes or take a look at what you're writing, but at the same time are a little like, be gentle. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I mean, the truth is I didn't share the script with them because um, I just don't, I think my, my feeling is I like to learn through my own experience. And, and I think they're great. Having a family who works in an industry like the film industry or established in this industry, it's a great thing to be able to go and say, what do you think of this, and get feedback, which I did do while we were cutting the movie. But my own feeling is I have a hard time learning things if I'm not going through them myself. And I don't... I, don't, I just don't want anyone to like solve problems for me. I'd rather figure them out for myself. And like my brother Jason, who's in the movie, and he's great in the movie. He's really, really he's funny. He's really funny. Yeah. Um, I didn't really approach him with the project till we were really up and running, because I wanted it to be real before I presented it to anybody. And I wanted, you know, you want your family to take it seriously, too, because you know, people have a lot of ideas, just like Monty. He's got big dreams right in this movie. But the people around him aren't really seeing it as a real thing until he meets Olivia, who makes him feel that it's real. And that's the excitement in that relationship. But Jason's really supportive of what I do. He's also a professional. And you know, I want him to see it as a real opportunity to be involved in this movie, not just that it's my movie. So his feedback was great. I mean, he was like, do, I, do you really want, do you want, do you think I could do this character, was his feedback. <laughs> Because you guys will see this movie, but... He approached it professionally, it sounds yeah, like. He yeah, he was like, do you really think I could do this kind of guy? And I said, yeah, I do. Convince me that I'm good for your movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he, you know, he's, he's challenging for, for everything. I think he really wants to be challenged, too, as an artist. But what's interesting about the role that my brother plays is that he's, uh, he plays this like business guy that you all might imagine, who's like the big shot business guy at the bank who's going to like give him this loan, right? And to be that guy, there's a lot of terminology that those kinds of guys say that my brother didn't really, wasn't really familiar with. And I thought that was actually better for the part because it makes him kind of like, he's just saying things that might not be real or make any sense. But it's kind of funny to hear somebody talk the big talk when they don't really know what they're talking about, right? So it was kind of cool because Jason genuinely didn't know what he was saying, like this character. But it kind of plays better because you feel like this guy is just giving him the runaround in this movie. Um, anyway, so, and, and my brother's also a, such a funny guy. Like I grew up just, I, I was always shy as a kid and my brother was always really big personality. So I love just watching him tell jokes and make everybody laugh. I enjoyed being like watching him do that show. Is that why he's the actor and you're the director? Maybe, I don't know. Cause I perform on stage with my band so it's a different type of, of my life. But 
yeah, when you're a director, I mean, you're guiding these characters, you're guiding this whole team, and you're trying to keep these bumper lanes so people can kind of stay on this path. But uh, I love just letting Jason rip because he's such a great improviser, and he pulled a lot of really fun things out, and it was interesting cutting his performance because we had to find those, you know, what worked for the story and then what was too much. Because you kind of want to use everything when somebody's so funny. But you have to really know what to kill and what to keep. And it's also when you're, when you're editing something that you wrote, what's really funny to you a lot of the time is the stuff that is spontaneous and weird that you weren't expecting that unfortunately doesn't push the story forward, yeah, is yeah. extremely tangential. But because you've been with this material since the beginning, it's really the only thing that makes you laugh at this point. And you need yeah. someone there to be like, we get that you think it's funny that you're ruining your own movie right now, but let us edit it <laughs> to the best place. Exactly, and I think that's, you know, we, we got a lot of feedback as we were cutting the movie. We would do feedback screenings, little focus groups, mm -hmm. and you use those opportunities to refocus the project and, and have sort of objective opinions of the project. But there were times where the comedy side or the, these, the, the colorful characters tipped it over a little bit too on the funny side where we were reaching for jokes rather than them being naturally a part of the story. But yeah, I mean, it's hard. I think that's what's tricky when you cut a movie. You have to figure out how to keep your story on the right path and not let these fun moments on set distract you from telling your story. And the other cool thing, and I'll just say it to the crowd, you might ask it, but my, I, I, we got to put my mom in the movie and she's, you know, she's an awesome performer. And she stopped acting, really. She just like didn't want to act anymore. When, when did she, yeah. she stopped for a while and then she yeah. was in I Heart Huckabees, right? right Which yeah. was like after the time that she had stopped acting for a while or did she, yeah. sort, or did she stop after that movie? No, she, she had kind of like, yeah, she, was, she raised us. And, uh, and for those of you who don't know, I mean, I don't know if you just don't want to, his, his mother is Adrian from Rocky and, <laughs> and is also in The Godfather. She's amazing. She's kind of a legendary woman. Thanks. Yeah. She's, um, she's a great, she's a really creative person and she's, she's a really awesome person and I always want her to act all, I try to push her to act and I think a lot of actors need that push, you know, because it's a scary job, you know, you're kind of, it's just Hollywood has a certain identity and we have a certain identity with Hollywood or as, as people in this industry, anyone in this industry, but so she, I think she's so great and she needed that push, but she was kind of like, do you really want me to be this character? Can I do it? Do you think I could do it? So there's that stuff that I, you know, I wanted them to feel confident that they could do this. And I thought she was so, her character is so important in the movie. And the feedback I get from people is that they really, when that character comes into the story, they really feel like it all comes full circle. You know, she's a different kind of anchor, an emotional anchor in the story which is needed. Which is probably a subconscious thing, too, because, as you said, as you've expressed, you know, yeah. you love her greatly and you have so much admiration for your mother, the fact that whatever the character that you gave her suddenly pulls everything into focus for a viewer right. of the movie, it probably has a lot to do with your own feelings about her, I bet. It is, yeah. I mean, you know, I think, I don't know if everyone agrees here, but, like, we have people in our lives, I think, that represent truth and a wake-up call sometimes, and this character is avoiding his mother throughout the movie and then they finally connect and it's at that moment where the timing is just right where it's sort of like it is a truly a wake-up call for him in his life and I, I I relate to that I do I mean I think as much as I don't want to accept those moments when they happen they really hit home in a big way you mentioned uh identity in in Hollywood and I always find this fascinating because everybody in your family who works within the industry is uniquely talented in their in their own way and those of that I've interviewed have always been like the sweetest people and sort of willing to talk about working in the industry and the family, but then also kind of like put it off to the side. But do you ever feel like that there is some sort of perceived identity of your family in Hollywood that like perpetuates certain kind of questions that you or your brother get in interviews? Like this one right now? Right, yeah. <laughs> I think there's perceived, yeah, I think we have, I think it's just human nature to want to understand or have an idea of what something is. And I think... Whether, I, I, so I, because I'm in a band or I tour or I have had those experiences, people might have an idea of what it's like to tour and they might be like, oh, you must blah, blah, blah all the time or this must happen. So that's just, that's part of it. That's the same thing. 
Um, I think people, you know, have an idea of things or want to know more about things, and they're going in with a certain set of ideas. But, yeah, I mean, it comes with the sort of, it's par for the course. You know, I think that, I, I have my own perspective of other people, too. I think I want to classify things or put things in genres so I can understand them better. But my, what's interesting just about coming from a family of people who work in, a, in the same industry is that um, I don't think we just, I don't think that's how we connect. We don't just sit around talking about movies or something. I, we, we have a great family connection just as family members, but um, people, yeah, definitely want to know how that all works behind the scenes. But um, I think there's just a lot of respect. I respect everyone, you know, as an artist. I respect artists just for what they do. And, uh, and I just think they're all really good people. You uh, have an album this year, you're on tour this year, and you have this movie. What's it feel like to sort of have all of these things happening at the same time? Well, I, I took a, I have a, so I don't have to say I have a band called Rooney, because I said it already, but. <laughs> Guys, he has a band For those of you tuning Rooney. in right now, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I just, I really love to perform uh, and tour, because I've been touring since I was like, 20 or 19 or 20, that's when I started putting out albums. And uh, it's just been a big part of my life. So when I'm not playing shows, I feel like I'm missing something. And I don't think I, I just don't seem, I don't know, I'll say it now, but I just don't know if I could ever just like walk away from the feeling of a live performance, music performance. Because I'm also performing my songs for people too. So there's a different kind of connection when you get to write a song and play it for somebody, and then they, when they feel inspired by it or connected to it, there's something pretty magical about a live concert that I don't think is like anything else I've ever experienced. And, but I also really love movies and want to make movies, so I feel like if I want to do both things, I just have to figure out how to do them. Because there's no playbook, and uh, I don't have anything to go off of, so I just have to figure out how to do them together. But I got to do it now. Like I got to, I'm touring right now. I just toured in October. I go back on the road in December. Um, so I'm currently on tour, and I'm putting out a movie. So it's cool. You're doing both. I'm doing both. Right you're you're now, making so the play. You're writing the playbook. I'm writing the playbook right now. Yeah. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Who has a question? Hey. Um, hey. Uh, how much preparation? We high five. Yeah, we did. That was awesome. You were my first high five. Yes, you were. <laughs> I was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how much preparation did you have to do uh, uh, before uh, actually shooting to make sure you stay on schedule? And uh, how much did the movie change afterwards from like yeah. what you originally envisioned? Well, we, I didn't know going in, as I said before, that 18 days was not a lot of days. So, but I definitely love the idea of storyboarding certain scenes in the movie. And that definitely, it's, it's really good to work off a shot list so the DP, Ben Kozelki, um, and I got together and we, we, would, we shot listed every scene. So we had the flow of what the visual flow was going to be of the movie. And then I worked with a friend of mine who's a storyboard artist and we, store, we would storyboard certain sequences that were a little more complex, um, the way they moved and interacted from, from one scene to the next. So having that helped us, save, it saved time. So we weren't just doing it on the, it wasn't just like, yeah, let's just uh, put the camera there. Like it wasn't really like that. And I really, looking back, I think that really helped keep us flowing because with such little time, we really knew what we were doing. It's sort of the way, you know, a pilot is gonna look at the you know, weather and plan the route. You know, I think it's important to have that route creatively. And I think, I think uh, also we worked with a lot of really professional people on set. Like the crew was really great. And everyone worked, it was a labor of love. Like everyone's there because they wanted to be there. There was no one, there was no paycheck that made someone come. Like they, went, they wanted to be there. And that says a lot because people are gonna go above and beyond because they want to do it. So anyway, that helped us keep the, the tempo. Next question. Hi, how are you? How you doing? Um, I was wondering if you have any like dream collaborations with artists you'd like to collab with, and um, what's a song you can't get out your head right now that you keep listening to over and over? With the song? Yeah, what's a song? song that you can't get yeah, out of your head right now? Oh, okay. Um, I think the collaboration, I don't know, like, it's a tough question because there's so many great artists out there. 
Um, but I, well, I hope, I mean, it'd be really cool to make another film and to be able to, to meet more actors and get to like maybe get, you know, have someone join a movie that I really admire as an actor um, and have them say yes to something. But I know you want specifics. What did you, speaking in like broad. What do you think the biggest lesson you learned about working with actors was in the 18 days that you had making the film? Um, well, the biggest lesson I think was that I think people, I look for what, what, what's the connection between everybody, right? Like no matter what country we're from or what language we speak, we're all humans and we're all here together on this rock floating in space. So like, we're all here together, right? And we're all connected. So what is that connection? It doesn't matter what job we do or where we're, it just doesn't matter what role we're playing. I think we're, we all, there's a thread through all of us. And with actors, I think that I wanted people to feel connected to each other. And I think to do that, I think it's just about really listening to people and giving them time to, to just let go and let loose and be, and, and, you know, trust in the process. But, you know, there were times where people really, we, we hit our 12 hour thing and everyone's like, I really gotta go, you know, like, yeah. we really, time was like up, right? And if you just talk to people and, and make them feel comfortable, you're gonna get a little more out of the shoot. And I think that's an important thing. Like, there's no, you can't have an ego. It's like throw the ego out because we're just gonna connect and do this together. And that's the most important thing. I think I learned with everybody on set. Wait, and what's the song that you can't get out of your head right now before we uh, wrap it up? Um, man, so hard, the song in my head right now. There's so many songs. You know, there's a song, um, can I just shout my own song out? Sure. <laughs> well, it's not, I mean, I just want to, I'll just, I can tell you, it's called Sad But True, and it's on the album. And I've been, Metallica, no, sorry. I know, okay. right, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's our own Sad But True song. It's like the theme of Dreamland, and it's, uh, I played it on tour, so like there's a piano phrase to it that I, it's kind of hypnotic a little bit. And Dreamland comes out this Friday, right? Yeah, 11-11, Dreamland's out. It's going to be out. Uh, it'll be in theaters. Uh, you can go to dreamlandfilm.net for the list of theaters. It'll be in New York at Cinema Village East, and then it'll be on iTunes, Amazon, On Demand. You can like order it or rent it anywhere, awesome. so that's cool. Robert, thanks so much for being Thank here, you. man. Thank Good you, time. guys. Thanks a yeah. lot. Thank you. Thank you.